Good evening. I'm Cleve Pointer. I'm the manager of author and speaker engagement at the Pratt. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. What a great crowd. Um, Makita is going to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we'll have time for your questions, about 15 minutes of your questions. Um, if you brought a book, she'd be happy to sign it. Um, unfortunately, the book is currently out of print in North America, but you can get it online. And most, important, uh, most importantly, you can get it from there. Uh, <laughs> but I want Makita to get those book sales, so I'm trying to like push that as well. Um, a couple things also. Uh, this is one of the many, many uh, hundreds of programs that we do here at the Pratt Library. Uh, my colleague Sophia, my colleague JP, helped me put together our Writers Live series. Um, and we have a ton coming up in September and October. Everything is available online right now. So if you're interested, take a look. I promise there's something there for you. And without further ado, I want to introduce my colleague, Patrice DeLillo, who works in our Maryland department to introduce Makita. Thank you, Cleve. Hello, welcome, and uh, good afternoon, or evening. Not afternoon, evening. So as Cleve said, my name is Caprice Didolo. I am the manager of the Maryland Department here at the Central Library. And as you might guess, based on my chosen job, I am a big fan of local history. Uh, but I'm also a, a big fan of true crime, or I shouldn't say fan, but a, a true crime buff, I should say. So this program and the book um, that Makita is going to be talking about is um, right in my wheelhouse. Um, I'd heard of um, the case that the book is based on, or was written about, um, in one of the true crime podcasts that I listened to, as well as the reboot of um, Unsolved Mysteries. But uh, after one of my colleagues recommended the book to me, I was really surprised um, and excited to read uh, such a detailed and expertly written um, and thought-provoking book about it. Um, so Brotman has lived at the Belvedere for over 20 years, um, which means her intimate knowledge of the place provides readers with both an inside look at the building, uh, where the body referenced in the title was found, um, and an appreciation for the majesty and rich history of the historic hotel. Her incredible observations and humor are woven into every page of the book, uh, even though it's about a very serious subject, of course. Um, but most importantly, she finds a way to do all of this without trivializing the importance or seriousness of the topic. In her own words, Brotman is a writer, mostly of nonfiction, who is especially interested in reconsidering and interrogating the true crime genre. This interest is at the heart of her two most recent books, the one that uh, she'll be talking about today, An Unexplained Death, The True Story of a Body at the Belvedere. Um, and her next book after that, A Couple Found Slain After a Family Murder, which was published by Henry Holt in 2021, um, as well as her upcoming book, Guilty Creatures, which is being published by Simon & Schuster and will be available in 2024. Um, she's also written about other topics, um, everything from car crashes, offensive films and hyenas <laughs> to her time running a prison book club for inmates of the Jessup Correctional Institution. Um, she has a PhD in English Lit from Oxford University and has lectured at the, the University of East London, Indiana University, the Pacifica Graduate Institute in California, and she's currently professor in the Department of Humanistic Studies at the Maryland Institute College of Art, or as we better we know it, um, MICA. Uh, teaching courses on Edgar Allan Poe, The Uncanny, Animal Magic, and Esoteric Thought. And lastly, um, as if that isn't enough, uh, she's also a certified psychoanalyst. Um, her articles and forensic case studies have appeared in the American Journal of Psychoanalysis, New Literary History, American Imago, and more. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Makita Brotman. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I, I'm glad so many people came. I'm glad I washed my hair. <laughs> um, I was just telling Candace that I'm, I, I'm not very 
I'm kind of an introvert and I don't use social media and I was kind of reluctant to do this. And I feel like there are two kinds of authors. One for whom the writing is like an extension of their personality and the other for whom it's like me, like a substitution for their personality. So that that's how I feel. I feel like I don't, you know, I said everything in the book and I don't really have anything to say that isn't in the book. So, um, but nonetheless, um, now I'm glad I came. <laughs> I'm glad I, I'm doing this. Um, okay. So this this um, app that the Pratt made, that cover there is actually the UK edition cover, and um, what was I going to say? Yeah, and um, with the book, An Unexplained Death, I really didn't want to have a subtitle. I just wanted An Unexplained Death. But these days, you just have to have a subtitle. You know, I was told I have to have a subtitle. People have to know what the kind of book it is, you know, where to classify it, and the fact that they need to know the fact that it's a true story and so on. So I feel kind of ambivalent about the subtitle. Um, okay, do I just press the... Okay, so yeah, this is the... Um, that was the British edition. And this was the UK edition, sorry, the US edition. Um, which one do you like more? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do too. The, um, the, the designer was uh, called Oliver Monday and he was a MICA student. And, and he's managed to get it like colorful and creepy, which I think is a really hard thing to do. Um, and I re yeah, I really like it. I love the colors and the design. And... and I had um another Micah student do the the little map on the inside, which I also really love. I mean, when I was a kid and I'd open a book and there would be like a map on the inside cover, I would love it. I would get really, really excited and to you know to have a map of a real um, area, real streets, and to know it's a true crime. That's the kind of book that would have really thrilled me as a kid. Um, so, um, so I, I was really, really pleased with the design. I really liked it. Um, how many people read the book? Okay, good. Uh, a lot of you, about half of you. Um, so as, um, kind of was saying, this is actually my 10th book, but most of the others don't count because they're academic books and nobody read those anyway. So, um, but this is the book that I, um, I spent the most time on and I put the most of myself into it and I that I feel most kind of attached to and most involved in because it's got so many so much personal material in it and I, I, I am very pleased with it it came out in 2018 both in the US and the UK and I think in the UK it got a better reception it was um, short short shortlisted for this um, Golden Dagger Award and and the same in the US, like people who liked it really loved it. And then people who didn't really didn't. So it was like really um, a real binary. Um, the reviews were great, like the official reviews, not so much the Amazon and individual reviews, but um, this is my favorite one. I, 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 this was in a magazine, I can't remember which one. This is an odd, slightly creepy book. It is the kind of book that's perfect for the person who poked at roadkill as a child. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I thought that was a wonderful review. Um, so I'm really, really glad that I'm in the Poe room because Poe is really important to the book. And I teach a course on Poe at MICA and I've taught, taught it for many, many years. Um, and as I said, Poe is central to an unexplained death. And um, one of the things that I really love in Poe and the Poe stories is the way that he pays attention or his narratives pay attention to like really small details that are often overlooked and things that later become significant. He's also really, really good at psychology and the psychology of his protagonist, but um, he, he, he pays attention to these like ambiguities and small details that are normally overlooked. And if you know his um, Auguste Dupin series, his Tales of Ratiocination, um, Dupin is like, a, I, I say in the book, a connoisseur of the obvious. He 
he's interested in like what counts as evidence and collecting evidence and traces left by evidence, even though it, these are not really crime stories, they're more sort of fictional detective stories. And over time, I used to like, you know, the best known post stories like Telltale Heart. But now over time, I've really got into the more obscure ones like the Imp of the Perverse and Ligeia and Berenice, stories that are almost more like little philosophical essays than stories. Um, and I, I discussed the black cat briefly in the book. So I'm gonna say some, a little bit about the black cat, but it is connected. So a lot of people think the idea from the black cat, for Poe's black cat came from these essays written by Benjamin Rush, who was a famous 19th century physician. He wrote these 16 lectures in 1811. And they were studies of what he called the murdering impulse. And there was one of these lectures was about a famous cat poisoner. Actually in that, he also talks about um, someone who as a child cut off cat's tails, who later get, went on to become a famous surgeon. So he's interested in like sublimation of impulses and desires. Um, anyway, the cat poisoner essay, people think that Poe um, read it and got some inspiration for the black cat. But in that essay, Benjamin Rusk, he writes about people who are like morally depraved, morally perverted. And he gives an example of persons who delight, delight in seeing public executions. And he says they're affected by a kind of moral perversion. And he compares them to like, like um, it's like a disturbance of the senses, like someone who has their appetite so perverted that they like, you know, rotting me, or someone whose smell is so perverted that they like foul smells. He says that these people are morally, their morals are perverted and they do not belong to the ordinary character of man. They're as much the effects of morbid idiosyncrasy as a relish for fetid odors or putrid meats is of the same state of the senses and of smell and taste. And because in the book I talk so much about my own morbid curiosity, you know, I identified myself with this and thought, is that true? You know, am I morally perverse? Is this really as perverse as someone who likes eating rotten flesh? And I thought about it for a while and identified myself with it. But then I, and I say this in a book, I realized that people like Rush who dismiss morbid curiosity as a vulgar and uncivilized impulse is because they've never looked closely into it and thought very carefully about it. And in the book, I say that they've never considered the details of its more refined variations. So in English, we don't really have any aesthetic vocabulary for, you know, for want of a better phrase, morbid curiosity. You know, there's the medical lexicon that doctors use and the coroner uses. There's the police euphemisms. There's like the, um, the black humor of the crime scene crew, but there's no real aesthetic vocabulary for talking about things that are, um, sublime but not in a high aesthetic highway a way that we would consider low and i say that i describe in the book it's more refined variations the subtle shades and gradations of that which makes the flesh crawl and so that's what i'm interested in this book taking morbid curiosity and then like going as far into it as i can and looking at it from the inside and looking at all the different levels and variations so let me say something about true crime. The book was marketed as true crime and, um, and people who, readers who really like true crime, a lot of them were disappointed because it's not really, I mean, it's more of a memoir than true crime, I think. And I'm not really interested in true crime in the sense of like mass market kind of paradigm of true crime. So this book is about a crime, but it's got all these tangents and peripheral elements. Many of them are personal. And a lot of people who wanted to crime complain that like 
why is she always getting in the way of the story? You know, I want to know what happened. I want like the next step. I don't want to know about her. I don't know much about know about dying rats. I want to know what happened and I want the story. And people, some of the readers were really annoyed and people who didn't like it, didn't like it for that reason because they were expecting, you know, a traditional mass market kind of true crime paradigm. And um, so I'll tell you why the problems I have with true crime. I mean, I think some people didn't like the fact that it was written in the first person and I was very personal about myself. And I, I can see that, but when I read books, I love the first person. When I read nonfiction, especially. And if it's, if it's written the first person, it's a risk because you've got to get the voice right and you can easily, you know, people can come across as too arrogant or self-involved, but, um, but people talk about like fairy tales and myths as being really universal. But to me, they're kind of boring. It, the more personal something is, the more universal it is, it seems. Like the more I can identify with something when it's really, really personal, when someone is, is talking about themselves at a really honest, deep level. So this isn't really a true crime story. It's more like an experiment or a reverie or a meditation that just goes in all kinds of different directions. So it is about the death of Ray Rivera, but it's also about my own obsession with it, about the Belvedere, about suicide, about suicide in hotels, about Baltimore, my relationship with Baltimore, the history of the Belvedere. And the sidetracks are partly to show how um, things can like layer on top of each other. They're not just pointless sidetracks, but like in the city, I, I'm interested in when you have these layers of history that kind of peek through into the present day. So it's like a kind of palimpsest where one layer is laid on another layer, but the, the, the base layer comes through and peeps through. And, and then sometimes you can see these simultaneously, the past and the present together. And also these, um, I, was in, I was trying to get how like the, the sideways and the nooks and crannies of the Belvedere on the outside and inside are kind of reflections of the, the mind, the human psychology, the kind of different byways and pathways of, of the mind. So that's one of the things I was trying to get at. So I'll just say a little bit about why it's, why I don't like traditional true crime. And this kind of relates to the unsolved mystery show. So um, most true crime, like it profiles dramatic crimes, sensational crimes, and that's just really a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage of the crime that's committed every day, um, these high profile crimes. I mean, you know, most crime is like petty, you know, tax fraud or something, you know, it's not interesting to anybody. And that um, with true crime also emphasizes like sympathetic victims, usually unsuspecting women, young women, and it always takes the point of view of the detectives and the prosecution. And the crime is often taken out of like the social and historical and cultural context. And the implication is that not all true crime is like this, but most of it implies that most murders are eventually solved by hardworking detectives. Um, and most murderers are brought to justice. And they also promote this idea that there are like bad people out there who prey on the innocent. And everybody, especially young women, should always be prepared for a potential encounter with a murderer or a serial killer or some vicious sociopath. But even in Baltimore, you're far more likely to be hit by a car than attacked by a stranger. Um, plus, most murders take place in the family and it's immediately obvious who's done it. And when it isn't obvious, the crime often goes unsolved. And then there's this really thin line between like perpetrator and victim, police and criminal, if you look at the, you know, the gun trace task force, as that showed, as well as like all those arrests of prison guards who are engaged in illegal activities. So, and a lot of one day's victim is tomorrow's perpetrator when you're talking about like um, gang, warfare and it isn't a world where the good are rewarded and the bad are punished and um and there's no obvious difference between the two so i think people like to retreat from this this ideal world away from reality but it's not the world we live in so i don't think those are really that interesting stories i don't think they're real stories i think re the real world is far more interesting and um and so my account as I said, it goes all over the place. And in fact, 
you know, my interest in the case heightens, then dies away, then heightens again, and the case is not really solved at the end. So uh, let me say something about the Unsolved Mystery show. Did uh, how many people saw the show? Okay, good. No, nearly everybody. Um, so they, they, I think it was two, yeah, 2020. This came out. So they, the people contacted me in 2019, and because they read the book and they were interested in doing an episode on the case, and came and talked to me, and I showed them around the building and introduced them to people and so on. But, um, and I did a lot of interviews for the show actually, but as, as time went on, I realized that the, sh the show they were going to do does not really have very much connection with the book. And it wasn't, it was like a different story that they were going to tell. And they made it into like much more of an artificial structured kind of case because they have a format and this really had to fit the format. You know, there's the good victim, there's the grieving family, there's a possible suspect. <laughs> There has to be a lead suspect who's very suspicious indeed. And they made it like completely fit that paradigm. Um, so um, do you guys know what a MacGuffin is? So it's, in a, it's a Hitchcock um, concept. It's like the object or device in a book or a movie that everybody in the story cares about and everybody's interested in following. But it's just a device to set things in motion. It's not, it's not really what's at stake. Like in Psycho, the the, the money that Marion steals that everyone's looking for the money and it, it's irrelevant you know it's the device to set things in motion to set the plot in motion so to me um the Ray Rivera story is kind of the MacGuffin it's it's one of the themes of the book it's one of the central themes of the book but it wasn't the main one and it seemed to me that Netflix the Unsolved Mysteries made a show about the MacGuffin <laughs> which wasn't the point of the book but that's okay. It was it was very successful and um, led to a lot of discussion. And so, very briefly, for those who don't know, in May 2006, the body of 32-year-old Ray Rivera was found on a lower roof of the Belvedere. Let me just make a picture here. And um, and no one knows how or why he got there. And the event was ruled a probable suicide by the Baltimore police, but the circumstances are disputed because he had no evident reason to commit suicide. Um, so that's really all I'm going to say. I mean, I can take questions at the end, but um, since the Unsolved Mysteries came out, like there's all kinds of theories and there's web pages devoted to analyzing the death. And, and it feels like it's out of my hands now. Everybody else is talking about it. So I'm going to talk about the other elements in the book. And like I said, there's, there's basically three parts. There's the Rivera element. There's case, like old case studies of suicides and things. And then there's historical stories about the Belvedere. But in between those are these like little islands. And those are the things, those are the parts that I most enjoyed writing. So I'll read you one of those. Page 139. Um, so this is where I, I I'm walking around Baltimore, exploring with my dog. I get caught in the rain. I go into the store in Southwest Baltimore, run by a dealer in African artifacts. Some of you probably recognize the, the store and the person. And so I'm taking shelter from the rain and he starts to tell me about how he got really, he taught himself to get really smart from playing chess. He, he said, chess teaches me always to be thinking three moves ahead. My magic is not so good for making people smart. I have magic for blessings and curses, but the curses work better than the blessings. I said, how do you know? More bad things happen than good, says E. I can't help thinking that perhaps that's just how life is. E does not try to force any of his potions or fetishes on me or persuade me I need to be healed, but this does not mean I trust him. Nor, on the other hand, does it make him a fraud. There's no clear line between charlatan and magician. E has nothing that works to solve mysteries or to summon up the dead. But he says I need no special tools or connections to contact the other side. I just need to sit with a pencil in my hand and wait for the message to come through. Back at home that evening, I make my first attempt at automatic writing, sitting in the dark, waiting to feel the gentle touch of spirit fingers. 
I sit for hours waiting for a hint, a sign, a clue, but nothing happens, not a breath. Perhaps I'm caught up in my own expectations, trapped by my own idea of what ought to be happening, what the writing should look and feel like, what it should say. It may be the same problem I had with my old psychoanalyst, Dr. B, the inability to let go of my expectations and allow my mind to wander. Have I been resisting what I cannot control, shying away from my fears, unbeknownst to myself? Or perhaps my faith is just not strong enough. I'm not sure that I believe in life after death, or even that I'm capable of such faith. My temperament may be too gloomy and cynical. Yet, as I sit there silently, pencil in hand, I can feel something growing in me. I hope it is faith, but it could be despair. Curious to learn more about automatic writing, I begin spending time in the George Peabody Library, a few blocks from the Belvedere. It's a beautiful and cavernous space, once described as a cathedral of books. The southeast corner on the top floor houses the books classified as 130 in the Dewey Decimal System, Parapsychology and the Occult, Dreams and Mysteries. And if anyone's from the people here, I did not climb up the ladder myself. <laughs> here are some things I learned. Things are 50 times more interesting on the other side than they are here. Those who have passed over would not come back, not for anything you would give them. Many people who pass over will not believe it for weeks. They think they're just dreaming. It is natural to find yourself confused, even a little depressed when you first wake up. It is like finding yourself in a strange city with strange people all around you. You can have pets on the <laughs> other side. It is so surprising how many people come up to you, shake you by the hand and speak to you. Everybody seems to be interested in you and wants to say, how do you do? The following week, David, my husband and I, visit an exhibition of artifacts recently unearthed from Fayum, a city in Middle Egypt, whose people worship Sobek, the crocodile god. It was at the Walters, I think. That night, I dream I've managed to convince a judge to order the exhumation of Ray Rivera's body. Uncharacteristically, I'm terrified of seeing the corpse. The idea fills me with horror. But I know I have to follow through with my investigation. I wake with a sense of deep dread, and it takes me a few moments to recall with some relief that Rivera was, of course, cremated. <laughs> Only in retrospect do I connect my dream with the unearthing of the artifacts from Fayum. The terror may have been compensation or perhaps wish fulfillment since the Egyptian exhibit was crowded and disappointing. The statue of Sobek, the crocodile god, was especially unimposing. Only fragments remained. Even so, as the informational plaque pointed out with no shame, the snout is a modern reconstruction. So that was one of the little bits in the middle that I guess I enjoyed writing. Um, okay, I'll talk about the Belvedere. So, Sorry, I've got a lot of things. To... I think the fire belt was um, an area of the country which was where things were most liable with, to catch fire, I guess. And um, every room outside, I never thought of that before, but every, every room faces, the, everyone has a window on the outside. There's no interior room. So one of the things I got really interested in when researching was the history of the Belvedere in the years right after the hotel was built in 1902 up to the 1940s. And because it was really where the wealthier people stayed, it taught me, it gave me this insight into like this genteel element of Baltimore, um, like completely opposite of the wire. Not just the suicides that took place in the hotel, but also like the scandals and the gossip. And it gave me insight into the city and the time period, but most of all, to human psychology. Um, so there were a particular number of suicides here because, oh, um, this is the Al an early picture of the Alba from the Maryland Historical Society. And I was curious about what looked to be these dog bowls at the bottom, like there seems to be like a dog bowl at every table. Yeah, the cuspidors were spitting and um, so, 
Yeah, people were, the, the Phipps Clinic um, opened at the beginning of the century, and that was early psychiatric clinic at Johns Hopkins. So a lot of people came to the Belvedere to stay at the Belvedere to check into the Phipps and ended up committing suicide at the Belvedere. And then there were physically ill rich people who stayed at the Belvedere when they were here for treatment at Hopkins and died at the Belvedere. And or, let's see, or there were rich people who just died eating a huge meal. <laughs> the chef was supposed to be one of the, the best in Europe. Um, most of my research came from the University of um, Baltimore. They have a Belvedere Hotel archive. And it's mostly actually financial documents and legal documents and not very interesting, but you can find some real gems if you, if you sort through. So I found out that the, back when it was first built, the, Bel the Belvedere had a barber shop, it had a, a theater, a terrapin tank in the basement where the terrapins for t the turtle soup lived. And there were characters like this hotel detective called Harry Shade. And, um, and it was kind of like upstairs, downstairs with the, the bellboys and the elevator operators and the chef and the waiters and the switchboard operators. So here's just a few items I found that I, I um, actually I did have a lot more in the book, but then the editor cut them down and I think she was right, you know, I couldn't go on all those sidetracks. So I, I actually, I'm, I'm not sure what this, um, a watermelon party at five o'clock in the morning, <laughs> not quite, that was during the, um, during the Republican convention, I think. I'm not sure what that was all about. Oh yeah, this was a, a sad one. Um, 1909. It was a young man. His father said he got into bad company, but other articles I found said that he was in love with this wealthy girl, Hazel Phillips, and his father didn't approve. And her family had a car and a chauffeur, which was very, very new at the time. And Tom it said, Tom loved being driven in the motor. And after he broke up with Hazel, he got the chauffeur to drive him to the Belvedere and um, committed suicide. Very early pioneer of chloroform suicide. He used inhaled chloroform. He'd recently had it used on him in the dentist and he got the idea there. So, and that was an, a sad, interesting example. Um, yeah, this is Grover Cleveland Skaggs. Asked girl's permission to cut her throat. Quite a feeble murder attempt, I think. <laughs> he called her home and took her through the stores <laughs> to see the display of Christmas goods. They returned home about 10 o'clock, and while sitting in the front room, he asked her to permit him to kill her. That's what she told Justice Friedel. So it was a, not a very romantic Christmas. <laughs> this is an article about uh, an incompetent hotel thief from 1917, Elmer E. Jones. He was trying to steal from someone's room. There was a fight. The intruder escaped, but Jones, the thief, left behind his hat, his overcoat, his muffler, his letters containing his name and address. <laughs> so uh, not a very successful hotel thief. This is kind of a sad one too, but it's also funny in a way. Um, a businessman called Harry Hassett, 1921. He, he committed suicide while he was in the bath and he was found with a um, revolver in each hand, shot himself through the head. And he left several notes, and one of them said, he declared that he was as crazy as a bed bug. And the other one said to, to let the Elks take care of him at his funeral. Um, I found a lot of couples who had eloped and then were tracked down at the Belvedere, um, you know, wealthy couples who had, had got married against their parents' will and they, were, they checked in. Um, this is one, this woman was in the news all the time. 1930, Margot Cousins, she was age 19, daughter of a Michigan senator. She is on the right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a, obviously a talented post-impressionist painter. And she eloped with this lowly bank clerk in 1930, shopping the whole of Sweldom. And they tracked the couple down to the Belvedere. And the marriage, the marriage actually lasted eight years. Um, Another interesting character was um, Charles Scandalis, known as the Greek. He was a prohibition agent 
who became head of a bootlegging ring. And he was arrested in the Alborg, um, escaped from prison, and he was eventually murdered by his chauffeur. A lot of stories about people's chauffeurs in those days. I guess you had to have one if you had a car. Um, there's also things like, like an elevator operator who was thwarted in love, who threatened suicide by climbing out into the a ledge at the top of the building. And fortunately, he was rescued by the fire brigade. In 1937, um, one of the elevators broke during a dance in the ballroom on the 12th floor, leading to a big crush. People panicked in the elevator. And it was like a terrible tragedy. Well, two women had to have legs amputated. So it was pretty horrible. Um, and uh, a lot of people suing after elevator accidents as well, because uh, the elevators were pretty new too. So they, those ladies also sued. Um, yeah, this was interesting. In 1953, there was a, a theater in the round in the Belvedere um, operated by Don Swan Jr. Um, Hilltop Theater in the round. It was like the, the winter session quarters of this, this theater in the round. In the round. Um, I think this is my favorite one. Ida and I just had lunch, strawberry shortcake and ice cream soda, but not at the above hotel. <laughs> um, so I think in a way, like it's, it's right that the editor cut because I could have just gone on forever with all these stories that I got really interested in and um, and I had to at some point come back and stick to the point. But it was really fascinating to research. And to me, that's what's so interesting about writing is like going in all these different directions and um, and finding all the details of individuals' lives in the past. And actually, I, I don't really read so much for plot. I don't even care about plot that much, really. But I'm interested in like following the way someone else's mind works, especially if it's a mind that's very, very different from my own, because I can, I can learn so much. And, and that, that to me is the, the best kind of unsolved mystery, the most fascinating kind of unsolved mystery. So I'll read you uh, a last passage. This is on 2.27. Again, this is like another of those little islands where sort of nothing happens. The weather turns freakish overnight. It's 80 degrees in November with the smell of decay in the air. Somebody moves out of the Belvedere, leaving a vintage wooden leather Chesterfield sofa by the dumpsters in the loading dock. I pay two men to bring it up to my apartment. When I sit on it, as I'm doing now, it engulfs me like a leather tomb. I adore it. Still, I can't help wondering who owned it before me and why they attached the four clawed feet to the frame with rebar as though giving it a set of concrete shoes. And why, when I sit on it, do I start to itch? I bleach and scrub the couch incessantly, but the itching continues and a rash appears on my arms and legs. I think of Walter Benjamin's aphorisms on late 19th century furniture, the bourgeois interior, fittingly houses only the corpse. On this sofa, the ant cannot help but be murdered. The soulless luxuriance of the furnishings becomes true comfort only in the presence of a dead body. It feels as if something dark has suddenly entered my life, has crept into the apartment inside the Chesterfield. All the inanimate things in my life seem to turn against me. The eucalyptus tree dies overnight. The piano goes off key. I start to get terrible headaches. In that heightened state of consciousness that can be a side effect of intense pain, I lie on the Chesterfield for hours, unable to move, listening to the ice cracking and falling into the tray in the refrigerator, the dog's claws pattering on the wooden floor, the ceiling fan turning above me, the morning doves scratching for seed on the sills. When the headaches come, I can do nothing but trace the progress of the pain. It starts behind my eyes and moves in terrible increments slowly backward, 
spreading the agony over the drum of my skull. I become unaccountably edgy, checking the locks on the windows, noticing shadows under the door, jumping at sudden noises, sensing movement out of the corners of my eyes. I wake up in the early hours of the morning, drained from nightmares. I go to the closet to take out our rugs of, out of storage and they fall to pieces in my arms. They are no longer fabric, but a huge nest of pupae, case moths, I discover. This, it turns out, is the cause of my itching. A tarot card reader once told me that the Ace of Wands is the only card that has no bad in it. Life is not mostly good fortune as people think, but mainly bad, with a bit of luck thrown in, more for some than others. But who among us is really prepared to take an honest look at the cards they have been dealt? The creative mind is better off with hints than with extensive knowledge, wrote the society hostess Marion Hooper Adams, wife of the historian Henry Adams, who, on the morning of December the 6th, 1885, committed suicide at the age of 42 by swallowing a vial of potassium cyanide. And that's, that's all I have, but I'm sorry if you wanted more about Ray Rivera, but I'm happy to take questions about that if, you, if, if anyone wants to. So questions about anything. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Lee. Lee also lives in the Belvedere. <laughs> What 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 floor? What what floor are you on? So that it's really it was really hard for me to find out, like you know who stayed in particular rooms or, or who because people lived there. You know they kept suites there. Um, I found some pictures that like looked just like the apartments now. You could see you know where the door was and you could tell what side they were on. But I couldn't find any that were like oh this is definitely on the sixth floor. There was um, there was some instances where like there was a beauty contest um and all the contestants stayed there and like you know Mr. Dakota stayed in room 502 and you know they had I could find examples of events but it's really hard to find out you know who lived on each floor I'm sure there are records somewhere uh, maybe yeah yeah at the University of Baltimore yeah Yeah. Yeah, I've never, I mean, I, I believe all that. I've never experienced anything supernatural there myself, but I think I've just got like, you know, such a thick skin for things like that. I've, I've tried really hard to, you know, last Friday I was like in a graveyard at night waiting, <laughs> wanting something to happen and nothing ever happens to me. So, um, so I think I'm just one of those people that, you know,
Well, let me know if you find anything. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's a part, it's condos. And then on the ground floor, there's um, the catering company, Belvedere and Co. for weddings. And they have the ball, they have ballrooms in the weddings. And then the 12th floor is, they own the 12th and 13th floor too, where they have events places. It's mostly weddings now. And then there's offices on the second floor. Yeah, go ahead. About um, after Ray Rivera's death, well, it was kind of like it kind of disappeared from the headlines, so people didn't. It was dismissed as a suicide originally, and I was really, I was completely obsessed with it. But nobody else seemed to like. It wasn't there was like an item oh, a year later on the news, but then I think because it, the police called it a suicide, people assumed it was a suicide. So um, there was certainly like speculation in the building but I didn't really you know I didn't feel like people moved out or anything like that um, in terms of economics the hotel actually never made a profit it was always short of money it was always going out of business it was always changing hands some railway baron would buy it and then it would go out of business I think it was just like at the time Baltimore had a lot of big hotels um, and it and it just didn't have like the you know, the, the traffic, the, the number of people who wanted to come to Baltimore and stay in a big hotel. So it was always kind of being bought by someone else. I mean, no, someone always wanted it. It was never let, let go into ruin, except there was a period when it was like a dorm for every college in Baltimore. And that was like a complete disaster. So it's all, and then I think it became condos. And Leah, when did it become condos? Like, yeah, 1990. And even the, the condo companies like changed hands many, many times. So it's like constantly, you know, no, I don't, it's not teetering on bankruptcy, but it's always like having trouble. Yeah, some, there were a lot, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, maybe you could say something about it because all I remember is like there was a big, he bought the Belvedere, he brought it out of bank bankruptcy, this guy called Victor Frankl, he was going to revive it again and it Yeah, yeah. Um, but imagine if it if it did, you know, if it did get. I mean, so many beautiful buildings in Baltimore have just have just gone to ruin. I mean, it would be just unimaginable to have it like gutted and you know redone as you know offices or something. It's just unthinkable. Yeah.
Really? I've really wanted to get into that, that nightclub under Lexington Market. Does anyone know anything about, about that, how to get there? Or I think you have to have some secret password or something. This whole underground nightclub. Um, well, I wanted to go to Thank, thank you. I, I tried to, I tried to be fair to Agora. I don't know if there's any Agora people here, but I mean, you know, it. In the end, I don't think there was anything. I mean, there's nothing. I mean, there's. It's a kind of sinister organization for various reasons, but, but, but I don't think it. I don't think anyone was connected to Rivera's death. But I think um, it just because of the secrecy, it lays itself open to all these kind of conspiracy theories and secrets. But um, I wanted to be fair to Agora. I mean. Apparently, you know, there, it's a very popular place to work. Um, um, the company gives lots of money to upkeep of the parks, and um, it's often like the Baltimore, Baltimore Sun best place to work. So that's another like I don't just want to look at oh, evil, shady company. You know, I, I want want to look at both sides of everything. About reopening the case, uh, no. <laughs> no, not as like I said. I think because after the unsolved mysteries came out, there were so many people kind of investigating, involved in it, and so many people were interested that I haven't really, you know, I don't think there's any any more developments, but I haven't really like followed it, or it's. I feel like it's like out there now. It's less interesting to me, really. It's not like my private mystery. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>
it. And you can buy it online and you can get the ebook and the audiobook. The actual hardback copies out of print, but they're, they're doing um, paperback runs. So it should be coming out soon. So we couldn't have it. Yeah.